What you can do is you can immerse yourself in true Catholic living. By doing that, you are, in ways you will never see, and in mystical ways, holding back the hordes. Eric Sammons, uh, editor at Crisis Magazine, is joining us by the grace of God. We're very excited to have him back on the show. He has an article over there called The Church Must Demand More, Not Less, from Her Members. And Eric, again, good morning to you. So so what do you think here? Are you trying to say in this article, The Church Must Demand More, that are we in the great apostasy? Are we looking at that? Well, I, you know, I, I always hesitate to, to to use language like that. I just know that we're in an apostasy. <laughs> I'm not going to necessarily define it as the the one capital T or the great one. I just know that we see it all around us, that we see from the top down. And we often focus in the kind of Catholic media world on the top, on what's happening at the Vatican. Uh, what's happening with the bishops, USCCB, things like that. And that's that's okay, that we should, because they are our leaders, and we want them to lead us to the faith. And we see a lot of apostasy there. But as you mentioned, my, my most recent article, we see it all around us, too, in just day-to-day -day life in a parish. In, in your normal, everyday Catholic parish, what you see is just mass apostasy. And it's a little bit different, in a sense, because with the leaders, you see it being promoted and pushed and and promulgated as a good thing. In the parish life, it's just kind of the air they breathe, and it's just like, this is just what Catholicism is. It, it's very lukewarm. You don't take it very seriously. I mean, I, And this has been for a long time. I remember as a Protestant in high school that my main impression of Catholics is they weren't very serious about their faith because I thought it was weird they went to mass on Saturday afternoon instead of Sunday morning and then they just kind of just they didn't seem any different whatsoever than the than anybody else and the evangelical protestants I hung out with we tried we failed often but we tried to live differently we tried to not be part of the party scene and things like that but the catholics I did we didn't see anything like that and I think that's just a, a reality and I think that's the primary driver of people leaving the church because the average Catholic actually doesn't follow what's going on in the Vatican. They'll see a few media reports in the New York Times or Washington Post or wherever about the Pope, and that will influence their view of Catholicism. But what they really hear is they hear the homily each Sunday, they hear the music, they they see what they see with the Mass and, and their friends, and that's, that's what impacts how they li live. And unfortunately... That often leads to apostasy. Don't you think that on a common sense level, most people, most Catholics, no matter where they're at in the, on the scale, don't you think they should look around and go, you know, things aren't really, things aren't really great. They're just not really great. There's a lot of problems in the world and it seems to be getting worse. And yet I'm surprised at how low that bar is for most Catholics, don't you think? I do think it's like the analogy of the frog in the boiling water, that most Catholics are just used to the, the way things are, the status quo. They think it's normal to go to mass and hear a homily that just says, be nice, uh, to hear incipient music, to really just be, be uninspired completely by their experience at the parish, uh, and, and to never be challenged once. That's just the way things are. And, and I think what that does then is it gives them no ability to discern what's going on in the greater world. Like, I, I, I'm i sure you know people like this, but I know Catholics, for example, 20, 30 years ago, they would have been completely against uh, same-sex marriage. But today they're for it. Did they have some grappling with that issue? Did they really study it and really determine, okay, what is marriage really? Of course not. They simply just watched what was on television. They, they were influenced by the, the whatever the, the Hollywood is pushing out. The news, when Obama went for all this stuff, eventually they just were like, yeah, I'm for it too. That's the thing is, in, at no part in that process did they actually think it out. Did they, and, or did they actually really grapple with their Catholic faith as part of it? They might have heard their Catholic faith means be nice. Therefore, if two guys want to get married to each other, I have to be nice and accept that. And so even though the priest who said be nice every Sunday might be against same-sex marriage, he was laying the groundwork for Catholics to accept something like that. And so I really feel like it's this kind of deep-seated problems we have that just make it the air we breathe 
allows Catholics to uh, apostatize and not recognize the signs of the times. I want to get into so that comparison that you make in with the Amish here, um, but there's so many questions also about just trying to pick your brain about how you see everything, because one of the things that I'm very concerned about, you know, are we in the great apostasy? Like, are, is our time any different than, the, say, the time when Nero burnt Rome and uh, started the persecution, which was, in all effect, a mini-tribulation for the Christians that had to endure that. Is our time as bad, even, as what they experienced? What do you see about all of that? How do you look at that in light of your own conclusions that you've based in this article? If it's not the great apostasy, I don't know exactly how it would look that much different. <laughs> um, I, but I do think the the key here is I do think we're in a unique situation in the history of the church in that we're in the first truly post-Christian era, meaning with, with the first Christians in like the time of Nero and things like that, and, and the first 300 years or so, you had a situation where everybody who decided to be Catholic was serious about their faith because they had to be, because they knew making that decision could be a death sentence. Nobody was doing it just because their parents did, their grandparents did it, and that's just what you do socially to be accepted. And, and then you have an era after that of Christendom that really begins with, with uh, Constantine and just goes on. Catholicism becomes the air you breathe back then, in, for obviously the hype being the Middle Ages. And then, of course, we have the decline through the Protestant Revolution and things like that. But now we have a situation where we have a Christian people and what that by that i mean a lot of our assumptions like for example just a tolerance which we both know has been completely obliterated a true understanding of it that is a christian value actually true properly understood that wouldn't have been understood in in pagan rome would have has no tolerance for tolerance right. <laughs> but today so there's these christian kind of bases but then they've been warped completely and what that does, it makes it very difficult then for Catholics to really proclaim the faith fully because people all think they already know what Catholicism is. Mm. And they think it's this watered down, lukewarm, just uh, tolerance for, for sin, uh, accepting of all different lifestyles, things like that. And so I, I feel like that makes it a unique time which does make it difficult for us because while we can look to the past for certain markers, like, okay, how did they do this? How do they do that? It's, it is, we are flying blind in another sense. To me though, what I always come down to is whether or not we're in the great apostasy or not, I actually don't have any, there's no difference in how I'm called to live. Amen. How I'm called to live is to be faithful to Jesus Christ every day to lead my family to salvation. That is it. I mean, that that is what I'm called to do. How that exactly applies, I know, is different in each situation in different times. But ultimately, am I praying every day? Am I attending the sacraments? Am I being uh, truly charitable to others? Am I raising my kids in the faith? Am I helping my spouse to heaven? No matter what's surrounding us, and like I'm, I'm with you. I'm in the news cycle all the time. I know how bad it is. But does that that even if it was great in Rome, I still have those obligations to do those things. I'd be getting more assistance from them, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that that's why I turn to more traditional sources of piety is because of the fact that they were established in an era that knew what it meant to be Catholic. They, they didn't have these influences of watered-down Catholicism all around them. And so when I attend the traditional Latin Mass, when I pray the old um, breviary, when I read spiritual works from back then, when I read about the lives of the saints back then, that gives me an ability to escape from what's going on now and be like, okay, here's my focus. Here's how I have to live. Mm. And unfortunately, what that means is it, it, it puts you in a lot more conflict with the world around you. We don't want that, but it is. And and so that's that's something we have to deal with. But ultimately, I would have to live the same, whether it was 1900 or 2023, I have to live the same way. Okay, sure. Uh, I totally agree with that, of course. But then how does that apply, practically speaking, to, for instance, um, whether or not we should criticize things that are criticizable out of World Youth Day? I mean, uh, you know, I tried to 
balance that load a little bit on my show. I tried to point out some of the good things, the purported miracle, that it, that would be a great thing. Praise be to God. The many countless uh, pilgrims who went through the trouble, the cost, the time, the, the hassle of travel uh, to get there. I mean, that is a good thing. Praise be to God. But that shouldn't negate or change our, our obligation to call out error when we see it. And yet so many in the church today, so many in that lukewarm category that you described so well in your article, seem to think that we should never criticize these things. So if, we're, if, we, if we live in a state of grace, pursue virtue, are, are obedient to our state in life, my vocation as husband and father, etc., do I just ignore the news cycle? Do I just ignore the scandals? Do I never call that stuff out and just maintain my own state of grace? What say you, Eric Sammons? I do think there is um, a different calling for each person. So my answer, my my short answer is it depends. But my more specific answer is, is that I do think most Catholics, I would probably argue, their primary duty is to their family to the, their, 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 the people around them, their friends. And so they should be engaged in living out the faith and encouraging those around them to live out the faith. And of course, because of that, at times it will come up, but the Pope said, do this. And like, well, however, and that's when you, you will have to criticize on your, on your local level, so to speak, in your own life, in your own circle of influence, you will have to criticize potentially uh, people like the Pope, but you're not, you're not, you're not bringing it up. You're just saying, live like this. This is how you be Catholic. And then when they bring up what, but the Pope said this, or my priest said this, the bishop said this, whatever, then you might have to criticize. So I would say that's probably most Catholics. The, the focus should be on just your salvation, the salvation of those around you, the people you have influence over. I do think there is a call for some to publicize what's going on and to criticize what's going on to help that first category I just talked about. Because I, I don't know about you, but the, the, the common, the most common, I get a lot of complaints in my work, but the most common compliment I get is from Saul of the Earth Catholics who are just trying to do what I said earlier, just trying to live out the faith and help those around them get to heaven. And they feel gaslit all the time. They're like, I know I'm supposed to be like this. I know the church says this, but I'm hearing people who have a higher pay grade than me in the church say the opposite. And I don't, and I don't know what to think. It just does. Am I insane? And then they hear, they read something in crisis, for example. They hear your show, something like that, and they and they think, okay, I'm not crazy. This does. I I was I was right to trust my Catholic sense, my Catholic spider sense, so to speak, of how things should be. And so that's why I say go back to basis on reading and having the spiritual, the, the uh, traditional piety and reading things like that, because that helps you. You'll see how things are wrong now much more clearly. If you do that, when you read, for example, I mean, just today is the feast of the assumption of blessed Virgin Mary. And I love one of the antiphons in morning prayer this morning is how I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to quote perfectly, but Mary is like uh, beautiful or something like that, but also terrible as an army wa marching to war with her banners that type of language, it just hits you as a modern person. 150 years ago, somebody reads that, they don't even think twice. A, a Catholic doesn't. Because their understanding of what Mary is and what it means to be beautiful, what it means to be a, a follower of Jesus Christ, includes this militaristic language. And even the Blessed Mary is, is terrible. I mean, that language itself, we, 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 would, we sh are shocked today. But I think if you immerse yourself in that, then you see very clearly when... World Youth Day has the DJ Jazzy Jeff Prince or whatever. Uh, 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 Father the, mix a lot. The, yeah, right. The the, the priest <laughs> DJ Jazzy Prince uh, priest and and then um and then they have you know the the, the tabernacles and and all that stuff, all the, the this awful stuff. Your your mind just immediately says no, that's not right. That's not Catholic, and I reject that. And you can say that while still, you know, talking to people and say, I went to World Youth Day, I had this great experience, and this is why. And you say, okay, God bless you. I'm glad God spoke to you. That doesn't mean these things aren't terrible, though. <laughs> you would have had an even exactly. more people would have had an even more beautiful experience if they had done it right. Yeah. And so I, I feel like that's the thing is like what we really try to do is try to, we need to order our minds to a truly Catholic sense. So these things are obviously wrong. So the average Catholic 
sees a lukewarm pair, sees what's going on in the back, and they immediately know that's not that's not right. I got to explain that to my friends and, and loved ones, my family, why that's wrong, and live it out in a different way. So they see how a joyful living of, of the fullness of the faith contrasts very much with the lukewarm that leads to people leaving the church, getting divorced, using contraception, all that stuff. It reminded me of what you were talking about in the Amish. Part of the reason why they have such a high retention rate is because they bond as a community, and the glue that holds them is their religion. And for yeah. most Catholics, I feel like that's lost. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. And I think you know the least foreign thing about a Latin mass community is the Latins. <laughs> I mean, because it's like you yeah. you it's totally my experience too that you show up and it's it's like jumping into the deep end and you don't know how to swim. And and it really can be a struggle and I think there's there's some there's reasons for that and I think it's just like if you dig all of a sudden if you jumped into an Amish community and you had no experience in that how foreign it would be. It would just be crazy. And a lot of Catholics today think that's a bad thing that in the sense of we don't want to be so different from the outside world because that's that wouldn't be good evangelization. As our world around us, the culture disintegrates more and more, people are looking for a lifeline. They're looking for something that's countercultural, and they're looking for something very different. It's why you see the rise of some things that aren't quite, you know, um, like some things that are, are uh, anti the culture, but they're not good either. And so like Andrew Tate, people like that, where that's not the way to go, but you can understand why people like that are attractive because of people rejecting the message we get so much today from the world that's obviously wrong. And so by by setting ourselves up, yes, as a very a very different, very countercultural, then yes, that that becomes an attractive thing and it does retain people like you say because once you are more and more into it, it, it does become something that that you don't want to leave. You, it's very much uh the rest of the world becomes foreign to you in a certain sense. Mm. And the truth is it, I understand your point about kind of an introductory. In fact, uh, the parish I attend, uh, I go to the Church of Latin Mass, but they also do offer the Novus Ordo that the, the parish does. And they changed one of their Masses a few years ago. The main Mass on Sunday went from being a very reverently said Novus Ordo to a Latin Mass. And for about three months before that change, the pastor had basically catechism classes, so to speak, for everybody to attend. I mean, obviously it was optional, but everybody was invited to attend on after Mass on Sundays to explain the, what was to us, the, what, what, well, not to me, but to a lot of people in Paris, the new Mass, which is the old Mass, yeah. but it, and, and, and to explain kind of a lot about that, to help them. And I thought it was a great idea. It, did, it was wonderful to, to let people understand the differences and, and all that. At the same time, I mean, the, the mass is intended to be grown up with. What I mean by that is like, yes, you are. It's going to be very foreign at first. But the point is, is that it's supposed to change your life. And that takes time. So you after after years of attending it, it becomes just who you are so much more. But that first Sunday, that first month of Sundays, that first year of Sundays, it is going to be still, there's going to be foreign things about it, but that's a good thing, I think, yeah. in that in that it really does reshape your whole way of thinking uh, in, in a completely different way. So I, I also feel like it's demanding, which was kind of the, one of the points of my article is that when you show up at a typical Novus Ordo parish these days, there are exceptions, but at the, the normal one, the typical one, it doesn't demand anything. You show up, you hear a few bland songs, bland homily, you walk out. You go to traditional Latin mass, like you said, I mean, it, it's a sung mass usually an hour and a half. It is got all these different sights and sounds and smells just bombarding you. You're standing up, sitting down, kneeling a lot more than you do at, at, at a no sort of mass. It, it's demanding of you. And I think that's a good thing because our worship of God is the most important thing we do. And it should be demanding. But then beyond that, it's like you said, the calendar, like ember days, rogation days. We have coming up uh, today's piece of assumption, but coming up, there's something called St. Michael's Lent, uh, which is leading up to the, the Michael Miss at the end of September, which is kind of a mini Lent that St. Francis of Assisi is the one who actually kind of instituted that. And it, it, all these things where you call dependence much more often in on the old calendar. Like, for example, Monday... Uh, yesterday, the day before uh, Assumption, the old calendar was a vigil of the Assumption, which was a day of penance. Mm. 
Mm. I love St. Maximilian Colby, but I don't think he wanted his feast day to be on that day. He'd rather have it on a different day <laughs> and keep the vigil of the assumption. But it's like you have these days of penance that just jump in. Like all of a sudden that day, my the prayers I was saying in the, in the uh, morning prayer were different. And they added some more penitential prayers and penitential psalms because it was a vigil day. And that's a, that's demanding, but that's a good thing. And it helps us really identify with the faith and, and, and want to practice it more fully. Let me conclude our conversation with this and get you to comment on it. Going back to your uh, Joshua Charles conversations about the, the catacomb, the end times. What holds back the world, the flesh, and the devil? Holy Mother Church, her culture, you know, her, the sacraments. And when we weaken these things, then we open wide the gate to allow the hordes of the diabolical forces inside the walls. And aren't we seeing that now? It seems, smells like, looks like, sounds like the great apostasy. I think that the fact is, is the weaker the Catholic Church is, the 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 worse the world is off. I mean, the the, the because there's nothing to hold it back, as as you were saying. There's no catacomb that kind of holds it back. And I would just say this: that I cannot change what's going on at the Vatican. I can't change what's going on in USCCB. What I can change is my own family's life, and that's what I'm saying to anybody listening here: is what you can do is you can immerse yourself in Catholic culture, in true Catholic culture, in true Catholic living, you will absolutely seem as weird to your neighbors and your friends as the Amish do to us. <laughs> and there's just no way around that. And you should, frankly, lean into that. I mean, embrace that. Not in the sense that you're trying to be weird, but in the sense that you're not apologetic for living like this. Because by doing that, you are, in ways you will never see, and in mystical ways, holding back the hordes. You can't hold them all back, and, and, but you can hold back some, hopefully from your own family and from others around you. And I do think your prayers, your sacrifices, your penances, they do hold it back. And so ultimately, if we are living in the great apostasy, it's clear that our duty then is to even up our, our game even more. I mean, even more than we have. And, and that, that, that's the fact is because as Catholics, and I'm saying as myself, first and foremost, we've done a pitiful job of doing penance, of doing sacrifices, fasting, and all that stuff. And, and until we really embrace that lifestyle, it, we, we can't complain about what's going on. I'm not saying it's our fault for what's going around us, but at the same time, that's our. That's what God is calling us to do in response: to do penance, to to fast. I mean, our, our lay of Fatima obviously called for it, and so until we do that, you know, we we need to just realize that it's going to continue. But that's that's what all we can do on our side. I think we. I think maybe we can agree to this, though. I think we can maybe at least conclude with this: as husbands, as fathers, we are the catacons for our families, are we not? Absolutely, Amen. That's exactly what we are. We are the ones who are responsible to hold back the hordes in our own family. And if we're not on our knees for our kids, for our wife, if we're not doing uh, penances and fasting for them, then we're failing in our duty. I mean, we're, we're called to be the provider. But we're called to be, though, also the priest of our family. And, and so, yes, that's exactly what we are. So there's something we can do no matter what comes out of the Vatican or the White House or Congress, or in the news cycle, whatever, there's always something we can do. And, and golly gee whiz, if the, if the Amish can do it, why can't we? Did you like that video? It's okay. You can admit it. It's perfectly fine. Hey, we cover the big stories of our day, from inside the church to outside the church to all points in between, and we do it from a Catholic perspective. It's called a Catholic Take. It's a radio program Monday through Friday. We live stream it right here on this channel, by the way, so make sure to subscribe, like, and share. We would be very grateful to you. And don't forget, you're going to want to watch this video right here because you don't want to miss anything.